praise Him, praise Him, praise Him. Come on and praise Him. Sing sunrise, sunrise. I'm gonna praise Him. Sunset, I'm gonna praise Him. Sunrise, I'm gonna praise His name. Sunset, I'm gonna praise His name. I'm gonna praise His name. I'm gonna praise His name. I'm gonna praise. Praise Him, sing it three times. Praise Him, praise Him, praise Him. Come on and praise Him. Sing sunrise, sunrise. I'm gonna praise His name. Sunset, I'm gonna praise His name. Sunrise, I'm gonna praise His name. Sunset, I'm gonna praise His name. I'm gonna praise His name. I'm gonna praise His name.
to pour out a song from our heart. You are good. You are good. You are good. Your mercy is forever. You are good. You are good. You are good. Your mercy is forever. Oh, you alone are good. We worship you. Mm-hmm. Your kindness leads me to repentance. Your goodness draws me to your side. Your mercy, it calls me to be like you. And your favor is my delight. Every day I awaken my praise to pour out a song from my heart. You are good. You are good. Your mercy is forever. You are good. You are good. You are good. Your mercy is forever. Oh Lord, you are so good. Oh, you are so good, oh, Lord. Your kindness is forever. Your goodness is forever. Your mercy is forever, forever. Your kindness is forever. Your goodness is forever. Your mercy is forever, forever. Your kindness is forever. Your goodness is forever. Your mercy is forever, forever. Your kindness is forever. Your goodness is forever. Your mercy is forever. Forever, your kindness is forever, your goodness is forever, your mercy is forever, forever, your kindness is forever, your goodness is forever, your mercy is forever, it's forever. You're so good to us. I'm so happy you're good to us. Oh, Jesus, you're so good to me. Oh, you love me. Oh, you're so good to me. Oh, how I love you, Father. Oh, Jesus, you alone are so good. You alone are so good. Oh, Father, you're so good. You're so good to me when no one else is good to me. You are always good to me. Oh, Jesus, Abba, Father, how I love you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy and your kindness oh and his mercy is new every morning that makes me so happy oh your kindness is forever your goodness is forever your mercy is forever forever your kindness is 
is forever. Your goodness is forever. Oh, His mercy is forever, forever. Your kindness, Lord. Oh, Your goodness, Lord. Oh, Your mercy, Lord. It is, it is forever. Oh, Lord. Oh, we worship You, Lord. Oh, we thank You, Lord, for Your goodness and Your mercy. Your kindness, oh Father. Oh, we worship you. Everything in me worships you. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Cry out to him. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, how I love you, Lord. Oh, I'm in so thankful, Lord. Oh, your goodness oh and his mercy don't forget about his kindness oh lord oh my father oh how we love you lord your kindness leads me to repentance your goodness draws me to your side. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, I tell you, neighbor, the Lord is good. And His mercy endures forever. Amen. Well, you can be seated. So good to see you. Faith Family Church this morning, always good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Praise God. The Lord is good. Amen. I believe some of you came to praise Him this morning. Amen. You know, that praise ought to be an overflow of what you've been doing all week. Amen? That praise ought to just be an overflow. You know, we're all uh, faced with difficulties in life. We all have things we have to deal with in everyday life. But at the same time, it doesn't change the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? And that God is on the throne and He still reigns in the hearts of those that believe in Him and trust in Him. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, at this time, I want to give you an opportunity to bring the tithes and offerings unto the Lord. Uh, if you are, need an envelope, there should be one in the chairs there around you. If you're making a check, you can make it to Faith Family Church or FFC. And the Bible says to bring all the tithe into the storehouse. Matter of fact, we may talk about that a little bit this morning because of the nature of the message that God has put in my heart. Uh, I will say this much, uh, kind of getting ahead of myself. Did you know that every time that you're sitting in a congregation, every time that tithes and offerings are received, you are tested? Did you know that? You're being tested. The Word is testing you. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove some things to you from the, from the Word of God this morning. And I know we don't like tests. When I was in school, I didn't like tests. But yet, I know, I mean, you know it's important. Amen? Test proves what you know or don't know. Amen. Are y'all ready to worship the Lord this morning with the tithes and offerings? Hallelujah. The Bible says, God himself said, prove me herewith. Which means put me to the test. And see if I will not open the windows of heaven. I mean, no, you can't open the windows of heaven. I can't open the windows of heaven. No man can open the windows of heaven except, now listen to me, he can be responsible for those windows opening over his life by being obedient. But without being obedient, it's like you're saying, Lord, I don't want the windows open in my life. I don't want those windows open pouring out blessings upon me. When we refuse to obey God, Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege we have of being called sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are so thankful, Lord Jesus, that you said yourself that we have the same Father. And you said, Lord, that you're not ashamed to call us your brethren, your family. Oh, Father, how good it is to be washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are so thankful that we are redeemed from the curse of the law. 
and that the blessing of Abraham is ours. We thank you, Father, that by the blood of Jesus that you have delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your dear Son. This day, Father God, as we stand before you, we acknowledge that you are the only true and living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us and rose from the dead and ever lives. And Father, as we stand in your presence today, we are quick to give you the honor and the glory and the praise for all that you have done. But we were lost in sin. But you made us alive again through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his blood. We were lost sinners. We were lost and undone without hope in this world, outside of the covenants of God. But Father, you brought us in by the blood of Jesus. And today, Lord, we thank you that we have a better covenant even than Moses and the people of Israel had because that blood of Jesus has ratified, has made the covenant, the new covenant, ours. Hallelujah. We're so thankful, Father God, that we stand upon your promises today. And as we bring the tithe, as we bring the offerings unto you, we agree with your word. We confess with our mouth, for we do believe in our heart that every need is met in our lives. For the windows of heaven are open because we're willing and obedient. Men given to our bosom, and we are blessed above all the people of the earth. In Jesus' mighty name. If you agree, shout amen. amen. Go ahead, ushers. Just worship the Lord as you give today. At this time, let's dismiss the super church for the children that's under 12 years old. And if you have need of the nursery, you can take advantage of that at this time as well. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you have uh, someone you would like to text them real quickly, you can do so. Tell them to tune in to the live stream of this service at faithfamilychurchsc.com. Click on the uh, TV icon, and they can watch us live. And I'm sure there's some of our folks that are out of town on vacation today that are watching us live this morning. Uh, you're, I, oh, Pastor Alice's cousin Linda is watching us live. We'll just give a shout out to Linda this morning. <laughs> Be blessed in Jesus' name. Brother Ralph and Diane probably, uh, uh, maybe uh, Hannah and David may, may be watching us today as well. Amen. Praise the Lord. We were in prayer yesterday, and I almost like I had a vision. I saw people moving to the area to come to church here. How I many you know that's important that you get in a church where the Spirit of the Lord can move, amen, where the Word of God is being preached, it can make the difference in life and death. As a matter of fact, it does make the difference in life and death. Praise the Lord. Well, some of you were not here Wednesday tonight, and so I'm going to share a little bit as I go through the message this morning of some things that has happened to us, and uh, the result, glory to God, amen, and uh, it's always, it's good. It's just good results. It's a good report that we have received because the Lord is faithful to watch over His Word, to perform it. Amen? How many of you know God is faithful? Amen. Now, two weeks ago, I preached a message entitled, How to Turn a Test into a Testimony. As a matter of fact, some of you might have saw the note that Pastor Ali posted on the Faith Family Church uh, web uh, site, Facebook, and uh, the because of everything that was going on, we didn't get the... Uh, devotions out to you. I told Josh he had pulled up one of the past ones and let you do those again. But the ones you'll be receiving this week as you leave today, uh, I had already written those before I went into the hospital last week. And that's important, especially as you read some of the things that I wrote. Uh, I want you to turn your Bible with me to James chapter 5 because we're going to continue. Today is part two of how to turn a test into a testimony. How to turn a test into a a testimony. In James chapter 5, the Bible says, now I want, let me say something real quickly. The word test is not in the Bible. How many of you know that? In the King James Bible. The word test is not in 
the King James Bible. Now, some of you may have different translations. You'll see the word test. But it's actually not in the Old Testament or the New Testament of the King James Bible. There are words that are used that does mean a test, okay? Today, I want you to listen very carefully to me because if you will listen and learn what I'm going to share with you concerning what the Bible says about test, it will make all the difference in your approach in the future when you are facing some type of test. You need to know where the test is coming from. You need to know how to respond in the face of a test, all right? Here in James chapter 5, the Bible says in verse 10, Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Everybody say affliction. Now what does he talk about when he says affliction? You'll find this word constantly throughout the Bible. As a matter of fact, I want you to real quickly, we're going to come back, but real quickly, uh, look with me in Mark chapter 4. We'll put it up on the board because I want everybody to see this. I want you to look with me in Mark chapter 4 in the parable of the sower, uh, especially verse 17. Mark 4, verse 17. Now, Mark, you play. We're coming back to James 5. But he says, I want you to look at the prophets. These are an example of people, though they spoke in the name of the Lord, they suffered affliction. How many remember David said, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Now, your translation may say trouble, because if you look the word up in the Hebrew or even the Greek, it means trouble. Many are the troubles of the righteous. He says, I want you to go with me, for example, and look at the prophets who spoke for the Lord and spoke in His name. They suffered a whole lot of trouble. Now, why did they suffer that trouble? The same reason that you're going to suffer through different types of troubles if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you speak in the name of the Lord. That means you're, you're not ashamed of Him. You're not afraid to tell people that you're a child of God. You're not ashamed to, to witness in the name of the Lord. Amen? You're not ashamed to bow your head and pray, at, 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 whether it's at break at work or whether it's in a restaurant in public or wherever it might be, at a family reunion. You're not, a, you're not afraid to stop. Hey, wait a minute, guys. Before we, before we, before we eat, let's thank God for this meal. Let's, let's speak the, the Word of God and ask the blessing upon it. Amen? Now, in the parable of the sower, I know you're familiar with this, but Jesus talked about a, a man who went forth and he sowed the Word, Right? Now, y'all remember, he said that the one that sowed by the wayside, that was a hard-trodden path, and he said the birds came immediately. Now, what does that mean? He said Satan comes immediately to steal the Word, right? How many of you know that the devil hates the Word of God? You know why? Because the Word of God is full of power. The Word of God has the anointing in it and upon it to release you from every bondage in your life. The Word of God is seed whereby a man can be born again, healed, delivered. He can learn to prosper in his life. He can be successful in every area of life. The devil hates the Word. How many of you know the devil hates the Word? Amen. Now, tell me, I tell your neighbor, the devil hates the Word. Amen. Some of you are trying to get caught up with me. I can tell you're, you're dragging this morning. Tell them again, say, the devil hates the Word. Amen. Say, but I love the Word. I love the word. Amen. You know, it's kind of like a football game. If you watch a football game, it's all about the football, isn't it? All the action, all the attention is centered around the ball. If you've been watching basketball like I have during March Madness, it's just all about the ball. Wherever the ball is at, that's where everybody goes. Amen? That's where all eyes are focused is on that ball. And I want you all to notice something, something this morning. You may think it's all about you, but all eyes aren't focused on you this morning. All eyes are focused on the Word of God. The devil doesn't want you to get the Word this morning. God wants you to get the Word this morning. Amen? I want you to get the Word this morning. And bless the Lord, if I have anything to do with it, you're going to get the Word. Hallelujah. I wish I could open your head and pour it in, but I can't. I wish I could open your heart and put the revelation of it, but I can't do that. But you know what? You can make a decision. I'm going to sit up. I'm going to pay attention. I'm going to hear the Word of God. I have ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. I'm going to receive from God. I'm going to learn some things from God. And when I leave here today, I'm going to leave here a different person than the way I came in. Amen? I'm not going to leave here with my head down, my, head, my, 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 hand, my hands hanging down, drooping, as the Bible says. It says, lift up those hands that, that were hanging down. Those knees that were weak and feeble and shaky. Let, let them be strengthened by the Word of God today. What's he talking about? You might have come in here all beat up this morning. But you know what? You can walk out of here refreshed and built up. 
Amen. Instead of being beat up, you can be built up. That's the reason Paul said, I commend you the word of God, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance. Tell your neighbor, say, the word of God is going to build me up this morning. The word of God is going to build you up this morning. Now, I want you all to notice this. He goes on talking in this parable in Mark chapter 4. He talks about people, and uh, we, don't, we don't have to back up there for right now, but he does talk about people that the word is sown in the stony ground. And he, t- he says for, let me see, I- I'm going to go over there because I do want to read something, a particular portion of this to you. I want you all to see this for yourself. He talks about how that, he says, it endures for a time, the seed that's sown on stony ground. That means just a little while. But then in verse 17 it says, when affliction, now watch, they have no root in themselves, and they endure before a time a little while. Afterward, when affliction, everybody say affliction. Affliction. That's trouble. In other words, trouble comes on account of the word. Trouble comes because of the word. Trouble comes because of the word. You know, a few minutes ago we received tithes and offerings, and I told you what the Bible said. What God himself said. God said... If you bring the tithe to the storehouse, he said, put me to the test, prove me, see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you, you won't be able to receive it all. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Right? 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 Did you know that if you tithe this morning, that trouble will come because of that word? And especially if you're one who just did it, who's just started tithing, then the devil's going to do everything he can to, to tear up everything he can, cause you all the trouble he can, and say, see there... You, you shouldn't have tithed. You needed that money. You needed that money. You shouldn't have tithed. You can't trust God. Now, see, you went, you went and you gave that money to God. Now what you going to do? Now how are you going to get your car fixed? Now how are you going to pay that bill? Are, y'all, are you hearing me this morning? Now stick with me. He said that pers- affliction and persecution arises because of the word, and immediately these people are offended. Offended means they stumble, they're tripped up, and they fall. That's exactly what it means to be offended. They get offended because of the word. They get offended because of the trouble and the persecution that comes into their lives because of what the word says, because they're acting on the word, believing the word. Now go back to James, because I want you all to see this. He goes on to say, now not only does he want to use the prophecy as an example of those that suffered affliction, trouble, but also of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord. Now you ought to mark this part right here. The end of the Lord. That the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Now the word patient means to be steadfast. It means to persevere. He says, I want you to consider the patience of Job. Patience does not mean just, you know, when you're standing in line, try not to get upset because you had to wait too long, you know, at the drive through at the fast food. You know, that's not exactly what he's talking about there. He's talking about when trouble comes your way that you learn to be steadfast in the midst of that trouble. In the midst of adversity that you should continue to stand and to persevere, believing what you've always believed, standing on the Word of God and refusing to be moved off of your faith in God's Word. That's exactly what he's talking about here. Amen? Then he says, and I want you to watch this. Let me tell you something now. He says that they, we count them happy that what? Endure. So it means to stay or to remain. And I told you the last time, two weeks ago. In other words, don't give up. Don't give up the fight. Let us not go weary, right? Let us not go weary in well-doing. For in due season you shall reap if you what? Faint not. Don't throw in the towel. Don't quit. Amen. The Bible says fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. That's the the one you win. The only good fight is the fight that you win, right? No one has ever lost a fight and went away happy about it. Amen. Fight the good fight of faith. So what is he telling us here? He's telling us, I want you to consider the prophets of old, and I want you to consider this man named Job, because this man... He was patient. He was steadfast. He didn't run from the trouble. He stayed. Amen. And he said, now, consider also the end of the Lord. Consider the end of his life, what God did in the end of this man's life, 
because of his willingness to persevere, to stand fast, not to be moved. And then notice the last part of that verse, folks, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Pitiful means extremely compassionate. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that the Lord is extremely compassionate. Extremely. Aren't you glad He's extremely compassionate? Not just compassionate, but extremely compassionate. He is so good. I am so thankful that the Lord is good, and He loves us so much. Now, if you're in James, go to chapter 1. James, chapter 1. Now, remember this word affliction means troubles or, or hardships, right? Now, I told you the word test is not in the King James Bible. But yet, there are two Greek words that are in the New Testament that are translated many times in different translations the word test. It does mean a test in short. I'm going to help you to understand this morning where those tests are coming from and what is the purpose, what's behind those tests. In James chapter 1, it's very important that you get this today. I really hope that every person here walks away from church today, understanding the difference in the two types of test, where they come from. You know, because we grow as we mature in the things of God. We learn more. Our, our, our revelation is progressive. We know things today that we didn't know five years ago. We do things five years ago that we didn't know 20 years ago. Why? Because we're still learning. We're still growing. God has continued to give us understanding and revelation of His Word and of His ways. Here in James chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 13, Let no man say it. Now we're talking about how to turn a test into a testimony, right? First of all, if you're taking notes, you need to write this down. Don't blame God. Do not blame God for the bad things that are coming your way. Anything that comes from God has a purpose of good behind it anything that comes from the devil has the purpose of tearing down and destroying Satan is a thief he comes to steal to kill and to destroy James writes that no man say when he's tempted I am tempted of God for God cannot be tempted with evil neither tempteth he any man now you probably noticed in that verse 13 that the word tempt is used in some form four different times. This word here in the Greek is parazo. P-E-I-R-A-Z-O. P-E-I-R-A-Z-O pronounced parazo. Now this word parazo, and I'm going to read it two or three times so you, you know, those of you taking notes can jot this down. This word parazo means originally, and I, I know this is hard to write everything down, but I want you to get the full meaning of, of where we're coming from. Originally, this word was meant to test with the purpose of discovering whether a person or thing was good or evil, had power or weakness. That was the original meaning of this word in the Greek. To test with the purpose of discovering what is good or evil, power or weakness in a person or a thing. But because this word was used so often concerning the devil, it later became, became to mean basically this. A test with the intention and the hope that the one who is put to the test may break down under the test. Did y'all get that? Now, I'm going to give you two different words. Parazo, the first one. We'll talk about the other one in just a moment. The other one... Dokamezo is never used of the devil. And you'll know why when I give you the definition of it. Dokamezo is never used concerning the devil when he comes to test a person. Parezo is used most of the time concerning the devil, but actually it's used once in a while where God tests his people. God never tests anybody with the hope and expectation of them breaking down. All right? That's the reason I told you the original meaning of this word in the Greek was to test to find out whether something or a person, a personal thing was good or bad, 
whether it had power or weakness or whatever. Later came more to mean that a person was put to the test with the hope and expectation that the one who was being tested would break down under that test. Satan wants you to break down under the test that he sends your way. God wants you to pass the test that he sends your way. Are you with me so far? Does that make sense to you? James writes, let no man say, God's the one that's behind this. And I want you to listen to the, the, the Kenneth Weiss translation, and it'll help you to understand even more what James was trying to say here. Okay? It's very important that you realize God does not tempt man with evil. Right? It says in the Weiss translation of James chapter 1, verse 13, Let no man be saying when he is solicited to sin. I mean, no, God is not trying to get you to sin. Now, what does sin mean? Sin in the Greek is harmatia, H-A-M-A-R-T-I-A, which means to miss the mark. Harmatia was the word that was used in the Greek when the archers would shoot an arrow at a bullseye. It would fall short. It would miss the bullseye or miss the target. For all have sinned, for all have harmatia and come short of the glory of God. You got me so far? Why? Because of Adam's sin from the, from the beginning. That does not mean that we have to continue to sin and come short of the glory of God. As a matter of fact, now you can hit the mark. Because the Lord has given you the strength, the wisdom, and the ability to be able to hit the mark. When you hit the mark, you don't sin. When you miss the mark, you sin. Are y'all with me so far? You do understand that the archers were tested. Before they were put into the army, especially up front with the best archers, they were tested. If they could not hit the bullseye, they failed the test. They were not tested by their leaders with the hopes that they would miss the mark. They were tested with the hopes that they would hit the mark. When God tests you, He is doing it in hopes and with expectation that you will hit the mark. When the devil tests you, he does it with hopes that you will miss the mark. Is this making sense to you? Is this helping anybody? Is anybody confused so far? Raise your hand if you're confused, totally confused. Don't be ashamed to. I, I want you to get this before you leave here today. All right? Now, let me finish reading this in the Weiss translation. Let no man be saying when he's being solicited to sin. By God, I am being solicited to sin. For God is incapable of being solicited to sin, the source of the solicitations being evil. You got that? And God Himself solicits no one to sin. God doesn't try to get anybody to sin, does He? Now, remember, when the devil is testing you, it's for the purpose, with the hope and the intention that when you are being tested, you will break down under the test. Go with me, for example, to Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Matthew 4, verse 1. You remember when Jesus went into the wilderness, led by the Holy Spirit? Listen to what the Bible says, and I want to read this to you from the Kenneth Weiss translation. Matthew 4, verse 1. It says, Jesus was led into the uninhabited region for the purpose of being put to the test by the devil, that test being in the form of a solicitation to do evil. Now, you see it says tempted in the King James, right? There's that word tempted again. Parazo. It comes from the devil. Jesus sent, listen to me, the devil sent this test. He tested Jesus with the hope and expectation that Jesus would break down under the, the test. Have you ever read in uh, Hebrews chapter 4, the Bible says that Jesus was tempted, same word, tempted in all points, parazoed in all points, even as we are, yet without sin. He didn't miss the mark. He hit the mark every time. The devil wanted Jesus to sin because if he could have got Jesus to sin, that would have been it. 
Amen. We would have been eternally forever lost with no hopes of salvation whatsoever. But Jesus defeated the devil. Thank God. And because Jesus defeated the devil, His victory is our victory. And not only that, the Bible teaches us that we now have been given weapons, spiritual weapons, whereby we can tear down strongholds, cast down imaginations, bring every thought into obedience of Christ. In other words, we can win in life just like Jesus did. He's our example that we should follow in His steps. Amen. Now, I'm serious. I want you all to get this today. And I want you to leave here confused, not understanding what we're talking about. Go to Luke chapter 4. That's the reason I'm not going to breeze through this and move on until I know for sure, and in my spirit, I sense in my heart that you're getting this. You're going to find words translated, even though it's the same Greek word, it will be translated differently in different places in the Bible. I'm going to give you an example. Still talking about the word parezo. In Luke chapter 14, you remember Jesus talked about the man who sent service out to bid people to come to a supper. And folks begin to make excuses. I don't want to read the whole thing. You can go back and read it for yourself if you like later. Let's go right to the heart of the matter. Luke 14, verse 19. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray they have me excuse. I go to prove them. This is the Greek word. Watch this carefully now. I might have said something I, I, I mixed up a while ago. This is the word, the, the second word, dokimazo, D-O-K-I-M-A-Z-O. Dokimazo. It is translated prove here. Some of your Bibles again may say test. Dokimazo, and it's translated in this particular place to prove. Now, what does this word mean? This word is the act of testing someone or something for the purpose of approving it in the hope that they pass. Okay? And let's say you've got a real good teacher. She loves you. She's done everything she can to help you. It's testing time. She is not evil, conniving. She has not designed the test with hopes and expectation that you fail. As a matter of fact, she wants you to pass this test. And when you pass it, she is excited for you. She is so glad because she's on your side. Amen? Y'all get the picture. God is on your side. Everybody say, God's on my side. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Now, I want you all to watch this. This man said, I'm going to prove or to test these oxen with the hope and expectation that they're going to pass the test. I'm going to test them in order, listen to me carefully, I'm going to test them with the hope and expectation that they pass the test. I hope and I really believe and expect that these oxen are everything that their owner told me they are. He's not testing them in hopes that they're going to break down. In hopes that they're going to fail the test. A letter that was discovered in one of the uh, digs that they do, you know, all across the world, the excavations. A letter was found. It was uh, uh, dated A.D. 140 which is not very long after uh, most of Paul's letters were written. Most of Paul's letters were written around A.D. 60, 70, 80 and there. This letter that was written in, in Greek, it was a plea for the exemption of physicians who had passed the examination. The word that was used was dokumezo, translated, pass the examination. That's the translation of dokumezo, pass the examination. The Amplified Bible here says, I am going to examine and put my approval on them. Concerning that man with the oxen. I'm going to examine them. I'm going to put my approval upon them. Right? Test, test, test. Is this thing working? Some of y'all, everybody do this right here. Did I do that in hopes that this thing is not working? Huh? Huh? When, when Holly and the praise and worship team get in here early and they start doing that test, 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 are they doing it in hopes that it will not work? Are they hoping there's a buzz in the sound system? Are they hoping that one of the microphones will not work? No, they're doing it 
with the hope and expectation this thing is going to work and it's going to work right. They're not testing it hoping it's going to break down. They're very disappointed if during the middle of their test they find that it does break down. Right? Are y'all getting this so far? Because you know in the past it's always sort of been cut and dry. People have said, and maybe we've even taught it ourselves in the past, but thank God we're learning and we're growing, that uh, maybe we just didn't understand enough about what the, what the tests were. Okay? We said, God does not test man. And when we said that, we meant that God didn't test man with evil. But yet, the Bible says that God tested Abraham. Pull up uh, Hebrews eleven seventeen. I believe it is. You can look in your Bible in Genesis 22, verse 1. It says, And God did tempt Abraham. Tempt the Septuagint. Now, let's do it carefully. I don't want you to get confused here. The Old Testament was written mostly in Hebrew, right? There was a translation of the Bible called the Septuagint. It was an Old Testament that was translated out of the Hebrew by the Greek into the Greek language. The Septuagint in Genesis 22, 1, where it says, And God did tempt, uses the word parazo. God did not tempt or test him with the hopes that he would fail under the test, break down under the test, but he tested him rather to find out whether his faith in God would hold him up or would fail. Y'all remember Jesus told Peter one time, he said, Peter, he says, Simon Peter, he says, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Right? Satan was doing it with the hopes that his faith would fail. God tested Abraham with the hope and expectation that his faith would not fail him. So it is written in Hebrews eleven seventeen by faith Abraham when he was tried again. That is the word parazo when he was tried. Find out whether he was strong or weak. Find out what was in him, good or bad. Things are tested. Your faith is tested. When we say, at this time, we're going to give you the opportunity to bring the tithe. You got paid last week. You, you earned some income last week. And the Bible says to bring the tithe into the storehouse, right? Let me, let me show you all. Go with me to Psalms. I think it's in Psalm 105. Something concerning this man, Joseph. We, we know he went through so much in his life. And, you know, folks, Joseph is a perfect example of a man who the word of the Lord tried him, the Bible says. He had received things from God. He received words from God. He had had dreams from God. At the age of 17 years old, he had two separate dreams. And in the dreams, basically, it meant that his family one day was going to come down and bow down before him. And, of course, you remember he was his father's favorite son and uh, had a coat of many colors. His, father, his brothers hated him. And when he told them the dream, they hated him even more, the Bible says. So they faked his death, sold him into slavery at the age of 17. For 13 years, folks, for 13 years, this man Joseph, who had those dreams and had that word from God, for 13 years, everything that happened to him, it looked as if God's word was not going to come to pass in his life. Sold into slavery. Falsely accused of rape thrown into prison, forgotten after he even told another man his dream and it came to pass and he was elevated back into his position in the palace of Pharaoh's, with Pharaoh. But finally, guess what happened? You may not realize this, but the word of the Lord tries us. Here it says in Psalms 105, verse 17, He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron until the time that his word came. The word of the Lord tried him. The word of the Lord, the Amplified says, tried and tested him. When we said a few minutes ago, we're going to give you an opportunity to bring the tithe 
and offered to the Lord, the word of the Lord tried you, tested you. You say, well, I'm going to try the word. No, you're not trying the word. The word's trying you. Are you getting this? You're not trying the word. The word is trying you. To find out what's in you. Where your faith hold up under the hardships. Where your faith hold up under the tests and the trials, the affliction, the troubles that come your way. If you do what you're supposed to do, it will. You know, a week before last on Friday, I had come up here with Tyler and I was my grandson and I was uh, playing basketball out there with him. And some of you may remember it was extra hot that day for this time of the year. 85 degrees and out there on the asphalt, even hotter than that. And so uh, when we finally got through, I told him, I said, you know, let's go to the house and cool off a little bit. He was hot too. So he took off and I'm following back to the house. And on the way there, my chest went to hurting real bad. By the time I got in the house, it was extremely painful. And I thought, well, I'll cool down, you know, and uh, things will get better here in a few minutes. And I'm just trusting God and I'm just standing on the Word. My wife's with me. She's standing on the Word. Josh and Rebecca come in. We've been keeping the boys. They came in. And after about 15, 20 minutes, nothing, I had got no relief whatsoever. And so uh, they, they insisted, let me take you to the hospital. And I said, okay. So we went up to the hospital. The whole time, I refused to fear. Remember, remember I told you, don't fear. Don't give place to fear. Amen? Folks, y'all got to understand something. We, just because we're in the ministry... Just because we're called by God and we stand in the office of pastors, that does not mean that we don't go through tests and trials. That does not mean that we're not attacked. We have to deal with everyday life like everybody else does. When I step in this pulpit, I step into a ministry anointing. There's a difference between the ministry anointing and the personal anointing. In our personal lives, we have to walk in the personal anointing just like you have to walk in a personal anointing. Amen? When I step in this pulpit, for example, when I stepped in this pulpit this morning, it was just like something just fell on me. Boom. I mean, it was just so easy. Y'all understand the difference now? Personal anointing. In other words, I got to live by faith. I got to stand on the Word. I got to act on the Word. I can't allow fear into my heart. If I allow fear into my heart, I give place to the devil. Amen. If I give place to sin, I'm yet letting the devil have his way in my life. Think about it now, folks. A lot of people think, you know, you know, if you're one of those, you know, one of those Rhema people, boy, if you're one of those coping people, you know, if you're just one of those faith people, you know, ever, you'll never be attacked. That's not true. It's not true at all. Amen? I'll never forget, you know, George Pearson, which is a pastor of Eagle Mountain Church, you know, you know coping ministries there, Kenneth Copeland's son-in-law, said some time back, you know, he was talking to ministers, and he said, he said, uh, I, he said, you know, a lot of people think just because we're related to the Copelands and, and all, he said, we never have any problems. He said, but people, a lot of times, they never know things that go on in our personal lives and our family. And I didn't know this until he just told it, not just recently, but back in 2005, he said that uh, on Christmas Day, Kelly Copeland's daughter was attacked. On Kip- Christmas Day, had to rush her to the hospital Doctors told her she had spinal, uh, meningitis, uh, spinal meningitis, very severe case. And, and to start with, they wouldn't give them a whole lot of hope. And he said, when, when me and my wife got to the hospital, and he said that she, her sister Kelly's standing over there by this window. She's got the report from the doctors. As soon as we walked in, she turned and she saw us, and she said, I refuse to give place to fear. And he said, that set the tone for everything else that happened after that. And needless to say... They, God turned the situation around. God turned that test. It was a test from the devil, not from God. Now listen to me. The devil wants you to fail. The devil wants you to fail. Do you understand that? The devil wants you to fail. But God wants you to pass. God's on your side. God's for you. He wants you to pass every test. And so we have to do the same thing. We have to stand by faith. We got to the hospital. They start doing, you know, they run the blood test, and, you know, the first one comes in. They say, well, this one don't mean a whole lot because it really hasn't had time, you know, for if there's anything happened to your heart to show up in the blood yet. So they wait a while, and they take it again. They come back, and it's elevated. And they said, uh, well, you definitely had a heart attack. 
this one doctor there in Monroe came come in and a cardiologist and he told me he said well he said uh, you are going to have to have he said soon we can get you to Presbyterian he said we don't do the procedures here he said uh, but you're going to have to have stents plural he said there's definitely heart damage he said there's definitely blockages is this, is this what he said honey She's my witness. I'm not exaggerating. I said, Lord, I don't want to... You know how some people a lot of times, you know, they, uh, uh, they uh, evangelistically, as we used to say, uh, exaggerate things. But I'm just telling you what they said, okay? And uh, so he said, as soon as we get you up there, we'll, uh, we'll get you a bed and get you in Presbyterian. When he got to Presbyterian, and so uh, they, they run more blood work up there. And on uh, Sunday... This uh, different doctor up there, he comes in, cardiologist. He said, I'm the one that's going to be doing the calf lab work in the morning. And he said, uh, Mr. Smith, he said, uh, you know, the enzymes in your blood have risen. He said, you definitely have had a heart attack. He said, you definitely have heart damage and uh, you have blockages. And he said, so we're going to go in and while we're there, we'll go ahead and do what work needs to be done. He said, we're going to have everything set up so we can go ahead and do whatever needs to be done, whether it's stents, bypass, surgery, whatever, okay? Folks, listen to me. Now, I'm hearing what he's saying, but just like Jesus, when Jairus, the messengers came and said to him, said, don't, don't trouble the master any further, your daughter's dead, I'm ignoring what he's saying. Now, I'm being nice, okay? I didn't jump up and scream, man, and say, no, you're a liar, and I don't believe that, doctor. <laughs> Amen? I just wanted him to see the results himself. And so we had a, there was a nurse there. She goes to a, a word of a church over in Rock Hill, Shield of Faith. Matter of fact, I used to know the pastor. I hadn't seen him in a long time. Back when we had our Christian school, we played them in volleyball and basketball. Anyway, she's been attending that church for a long time. And uh, she was my main nurse during the daytime from 7 in the morning to 7 at night. And so she heard us releasing our faith. And we begin to decree. When they go in, they will find nothing. There will be no heart damage. I'm trying to tell you how to turn a test into a testimony. Job 22, listen to 28, says, Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. Right? Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. Jesus said, you're going to have what you say. Right? He didn't say you're going to have what the doctor said you're going to have. Did you hear what I said? He said you will have what you say. If you don't doubt in your heart and you believe in things you say will come to pass, you will have whatever you say. I believed and I refused to doubt. My wife believed and refused to doubt. My children would believe and refused to doubt. Everybody stood in faith. No one said a single word, but what if this? And what if that? None of us. The Bible says that if you never say the wrong thing, that you are a complete, a mature person. Now, I hadn't arrived where I never say the wrong thing, especially when I get mad. I Sometimes I say things I shouldn't say. I'm not talking about cussing, stuff like that, you know. But I refuse when it comes to physical help. I don't know. It's been so long, I can't even remember. It's been years and years since I've said the wrong thing about physical help or the wrong thing about finances, okay? That's the reason we've got to be careful that we live by faith. Not be controlled by our feelings, not be controlled by our emotions, right? But stand on the Word. And so we did that. And we decreed they will find nothing. And I, I didn't even get a chance to tell my wife, I just remember this. That nurse, now she's a Word of Faith person, goes to a Word of Faith church. She heard my wife say it. She heard me say it. Before she went off duty Sunday night, she said, are you in faith? And I said, I'm 100% in faith. And she said, okay. And... uh so when I came in back from the lab that morning, she was already in the room. And she was smiling, and she said, oh, I done told him. She said, I heard. She said, I done told him. I won't be able to live with him now. She said, I already heard because the doctors told me while I'm laying there on that table, and they got that thing run up my arm right there, run, you know, into your chest. He said, I have looked at it at every angle, Mr. Smith. And he said, I cannot find any damage whatsoever to your heart he said no blockages whatsoever he did say something about a tiny something in a little tiny vessel he said which is really not even enough to talk about and nothing has to be done he said 
He said, you don't have to do anything. He said, we don't have to do anything. No stents, no surgery, no heart damage. Praise God. And I give God the glory, okay? I said, I give God all the praise and all the honor, all the glory, amen? But folks, I want y'all to understand something. You've got to stand and having done all, stand. In other words, having done all that you know that you're supposed to do, you just stand regardless of anything else. Regardless. He didn't say you'll have what the doctor said. He didn't say you'll have what the banker said. He didn't say you'll have what your neighbor said. He said you'll have what you say. Amen? How many of it's important to be careful what you say? Amen. All right, I got to move on here. I got, I, I got still got a good bit to share with you. Y'all learned anything today? All right. Now, look with me in John 6. John 6, the Gospel of John. Now, remember, we just talked about the word dokomozo, how that this word means the act of testing someone or something for the purpose of approving it and hope that they pass. Now, in Luke 14, it was translated the word prove in the King James, right? Again, now I want you to watch this. Let me, let me find it real quickly. Remember, Jesus had been preaching to the people, and uh, the people were hungry. And the Bible says in John 6, Jesus, in verse 5, lifted up his eyes. He saw a great company come to him. He said to Philip, Whence or from where shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to what? Every said, he says he said to prove him. The Amplified says to prove or to test him. Now, remember I told you sometimes the word, the, the King James will translate a word like Luke 14, prove and here prove, but it's not the same Greek word. Luke 14, to prove his oxen, was dokomezo. He did it with the hopes that they would pass the test. This is parezo. Jesus didn't do it with the hopes that they would fail. He did it to find out what was in him. He did it to find out whether he had faith or a lack of faith. It brought out what was in his thinking. If you read the rest of this, you'll discover it brought out what he was in his thinking because he was thinking on a natural plane instead of a faith. He's thinking in faith, a spiritual way, Right? He's thinking, how are we going to feed these people? We're going to get the money. We're out here with all these thousands of people. How are we going to do it? Jesus was testing him to find out whether he had faith to feed them or if he, had lack of, he lacked faith to do it. Now, folks, let me tell you something. If you ever come to a point in your life and you realize that your faith is being tested for the purpose of the hopes that it will be approved, no that God wants you to pass the test. You say, but what if I fail the test? What well, big deal. Take it again. If you fail the test that God sends your way, remember the test from God is never evil. It's not sickness. It's not disease. Every time you find that God is testing somebody, it's concerning their faith. Okay? He wants you to, to use your faith. He wants your faith to get stronger. Amen? It's never something evil sent to you from God. God doesn't test your faith by putting cancer on you. Making you have a car wreck, taking one of your children. That's all evil. Everything that comes from the devil is evil and bad. Right? Everything that comes from God has a good purpose behind it. Let me show you. This will help you all understand a little bit more. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm just going to read this to you from the uh, Weiss translation to save some time. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. It says, In which last season you are to be constantly rejoicing with the joy. Y'all remember James chapter 1 counted all joy, brethren, when you fall into what? Temptations. Tests that come your way. We're going to read that in just a moment. We're going back up and read that because I want you to understand why it comes. Why? Matter of fact, go ahead and back up right now. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Let's go ahead and read it. James chapter 1. Verse 1. James, the bond of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes, those in the dispersion. 
Be constantly rejoicing. Consider it a matter of unadulterated joy without any admixture of sorrow whenever you fall into the midst of variegated trials which surround you, knowing experientially that the approving of your faith, this is Dokumezo, the approving of your faith, that faith having been put to the test for the purpose of being approved, and having met the test has been approved. You got it? Your faith is being tested or proved for the sake that it will be approved. Now, look what it, Peter says. Peter says in verses 6 and 7, A joy that expresses itself in a triumphant exuberance, although for a little while at the present time, if perchance there is need for it, you have been made sorrowful in the midst of many different kinds of testings, in order that the approval of your faith, which faith was examined by testing, for the purpose of being approved, that approval being much more precious than the approval of gold which perisheth, even though that gold be approved by fire testing, may be discovered after scrutiny to result in praise and glory and honor at the time of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, folks, if you ever had a chance to go to a smelting uh, factory where they take the gold and they melt it down, here's what you would find. The heat is intense to melt that gold. The purpose is not to destroy the gold. The purpose is for the goal to be tested so as that it will be approved for certain use. Are you with me so far? They want to get the impurities out of the gold. The impurities rise to the top. When the gold melts, all the impurities, all the alloys rise to the top. they got a skimmer where they skim off those alloys in hopes that there will be nothing left but pure gold. Are you with me so far? The Bible talks about unfeigned faith. It talks about hypocritical faith. When you are being tested as gold is being tested, it is to get rid of everything that is not real, that is not genuine concerning your faith in God. Is it helping anybody? Now, I'm giving you this before we go to the book of Job because I want you to have a better understanding than you've ever had about what went on in Job's life. James says, I want you to remember his patience, his endurance, and I want you to remember what happened at the end. And also, I want you to remember that the Lord is very, very extremely compassionate and full of mercy. Amen? Now, why don't we look at this? Go with me to the book of Job. Go with me to the book of Job. For those of you who maybe have thought about 1 Corinthians 10 13, we won't take the time to turn there. The Bible says, No temptation, no temptation has taken you, such, but such as is common to man. And with every temptation, God will make a way of escape. It's parazo. Those are, Paul is talking about those tests that come from the devil. And God will not allow you to be tested by the devil above and beyond that which you can pass. In other words, it'd be like a, a school principal. Okay? There's a particular teacher in the school that everybody hates. She's been hated for the last 40 years. Your parents had her and they hated her. She's mean. Everybody hates this woman or man. Okay? Y'all know what I'm talking about. And finally, the principal has got enough. He says, I'm going to look into this, and I'm going to find out why everybody for the last three generations has hated that woman. And so one day, he checks the test that she's prepared to give her students. And he looks over the test, and then he gets out the textbook, and he goes to her, and he says, Listen, I checked up on this test that you're about to give to your students, and it has nothing to do with the textbook. There's nothing on this test that the answer is in the textbook. And I refuse to allow you to give them that test. That's our Father. That's our Father. The answer to every test the devil will send your way is right here. 
when Satan sent that test at us, listen to me. I say at us because we're one and we stand together. Now listen to me. When Satan sent that test at us, it was in hopes that we would fail the test. But our Heavenly Father would not allow him to test us on something unless the answer was in the book. Now, if I had been lazy and not studied the answers in this book, there's a good chance that I would have failed the test. Y'all got me now? Why do you think the Bible says study to show yourself approved unto God? A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Follow those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Amen. Y'all got to see this. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. You know, you can go to a bar and you'll find people who know a whole lot about Job. I'm serious. You can go to any honky-tonk, any bar, and if you want to talk about Paul's thorn in the flesh, if you want to talk about Timothy's wine for the stomach's sake, or if you want to talk about Job, you'll find a lot of people talk with you. Now, if you start talking about the love of God and faith and divine healing, things like that, then, you know, you ain't going to find anybody going to talk with you. But they love to talk about those three things. Because all their life they've been taught. Poor old Job. Well, folks... If you're like old Job, then get on through what you've been going through. Amen? And come out victorious on the other side. Because Job came out on top, folks. Amen? Here in Job chapter 1, and I don't have time. We, folks, uh, I advise you to maybe just read the whole book. I sat down yesterday and read the whole book of Job again. And, uh, and I'm going to tell you something. Job's three friends, they didn't have a clue. You do not need Job's... Three friends like Job's three friends. You hear what I said? But I guarantee you got them. I guarantee you have relatives like them and friends like those. Because you know what they said? I'm going to sum it up for you in a nutshell. God told Eliphaz, he says, you and your two friends, he said, I want you to get Job to pray for y'all because what you said about me was not as right as what Job said about me. Now, everything that Job said was not right. But what he did say was a whole lot closer to the truth overall than what those three friends said. What did those three friends say? In a nutshell, here's what they said. They took turns. Go all through the book of Job. They took turns. All three of them. And here's what they told them. Job, you're in sin, and God is punishing you for your sin. If you were righteous, and if you were not in sin, then this would not have happened to you. God is punishing you because of your sin. That's what they told him. That's in a nutshell. Over and over and over, they told him, you are being punished for your sin. Now, Job, on the other hand, let me tell you where he missed it. Job maintained his integrity that he had been living righteously, but because of his lack of understanding of where the test came from, he, like a lot of people today, thought that it was coming from God. He did not know that it was coming from the devil. Did you know that the average Christian today, when evil comes their way, let's say they're diagnosed with some incurable disease, as the doctors call it, did you know that they will begin to say things, uh, well, let me, let's, let's bring it even closer. Recently, uh, someone passed away. A friend of somebody that we know passed away. And people on Facebook, I read some of the comments, and one of them said, just remember God's in control. This was a young person that had died. Just remember God's in, in control. Another one said, uh, we, we love you, we're praying for you, and remember that everything happens for a reason. On and on this stuff goes. People are blaming God because of a lack of knowledge. God said, my people are destroyed. Because of what? A lack of knowledge. It's a lack of knowledge that people have. Job had a lack of knowledge. Y'all do understand that Job was written a long, long time ago. Job was actually written, the Bible scholars tell us, before any of the books of 
uh, of Moses, even before Genesis. Job didn't know about the covenant of Abraham. Job didn't know about the new covenant that we have today in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible makes it very clear, if you look in Job chapter 1 and verse 6, where this attack, where this test came from. It says, And there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. The Lord said to Satan, Whence comest thou? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and walking up and down in it. The Lord said to Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? That he's, there's none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and eschews evil. Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Hast thou not Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house, about all that he has on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thy hand now and touch all that he has, and he will curse thee to thy face. In other words, this attack from Satan was meant for evil. He wanted Job to pass, not to pass, but to fail the test, right? He wanted Job to curse God. He even got his wife. The devil even got Job's wife to cooperate. She came to him. Re now listen to me carefully. Always remember that if a voice is telling you to say something, you need to check up on it and ask, is this coming from God or is this coming from the devil? She went to her husband and said, curse God and die. The devil wanted him to fail this test. Amen? Let me point something out to you here. This is, this is awesome. Open your Bibles. Uh, you can mark it there if you want to. We may come back. I don't know. Well, let's just go, go to Isaiah 45. I'm going to put this up on the Amplified Translation, Marilyn. Isaiah 45, 18. I want to point something out to you. In verse 9, the devil answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Does Job fear God for nothing? I want to ask you something. Do you fear God for nothing? There's a lot of people who say you shouldn't ever expect anything from God. R really? Why shouldn't I expect something from God? If we shouldn't expect something back from God, why should we pray? If we shouldn't expect something back from God, why should we tithe and give? Huh? Are y'all hearing what I'm saying to you? Now, in Isaiah 45, I'm just going to read it up here on the, on the board, the Amplified Translation. Thus says the Lord... Who created the heavens, God Himself who formed the earth and made it, who established it and did not create it to be a worthless waste, He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord. There is no one else. Verse 19. I have not spoken in secret in a corner of the land of darkness. I did not call the descendants of Jacob to a fruitless service, saying, Seek me for nothing. But I promised them what? A just reward. God said, I did not call the descendants of Jacob, the nation of Israel, to a fruitless service. I told them, I did not tell them, seek me for nothing, but I promised them a just reward. From the very beginning, God appeared to a man by the name of Abram, and he said, I will bless you, and what? You will be a blessing. There's a promise right there, folks of a just reward that if you serve me that you will be blessed there are actually people who say when you tithe and bring offer to the Lord that you shouldn't expect anything in return oh really go to Malachi chapter 3 go to Malachi go to, let's go we've been talking about that some anyway let's look at that real quickly okay if we should expect nothing from the Lord then why tithe huh if it's true, like some of the people used to pray in the old churches, when they come time to receive the offering, Lord, bless those that give and bless those that don't give. I mean, I, really, y'all, anybody ever heard that pray? Pray. Bless those that give, bless those that don't give. And I'm sitting there with my tithe, and I'm thinking, Lord, uh, now wait a minute. If you bless them equally, let's say I've got a $50 tithe here, and you're going to bless this man sitting beside me just as the way you're going to bless me, then that means I'm going to be out of 50 bucks. 
Because if you're going to bless him the same as you're going to bless me, then I'm going to keep this 50, and I'm going to get what you're going to bless us with anyway. I know that sounds ridiculous, but y'all get my point, right? Amen? What did God say? God told His people in Malachi, and I want to read verses 10 through 14. He says, Bring all the tithe to the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. Prove me. There it is. Everybody say prove. prove. Folks, that means test. Okay? Prove me here, we have saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. He shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. All nations shall call you blessed. For you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Your words have been stout or hard against me, saith the Lord. You say, what have we spoken so much against you? You have said it is vain to serve God. What profit is it that we tithe? Kept this ordinance. This ordinance specifically is talking about the tithe. So they are saying it's useless to serve God. It's useless to tithe. God said, your words have been stout, hard against me. Folks, I want y'all to know something. It does. The Lord makes the difference in our lives. Okay? If you go back and you read into the first chapter of Job, you will find in those first verses how many thousands of sheep and, and donkeys and cattle and everything else that this man had. Job was a very wealthy man. God had greatly blessed this man. He knew that the blessings in his life had came from God. The devil recognized that the blessings came from God. I want you to look, pull up uh, Job 1 verse 9 for me real quickly. I want everybody to see this. Job verse 10, I'm sorry. Job 1 10. Now notice that what the devil said. The devil said, does he serve you for nothing? Of course he doesn't serve you for nothing. Right? Has that not made a what about him? The word hedge means a fence of protection. It is a fence of protection. Now, let me ask you something. If we have a better covenant than anybody who's ever lived before through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and this man had a hedge of protection, a fence of protection around him, then how much more should you have one around you and your family have one around them as people of God? Amen? Let me, let, let me, let's go further now. Let's, let's fast forward from Job. Let's go years and years down the road to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to the twelve sons of Jacob. And the nation of Israel now has grown into a great nation, even though they're living in bondage in Egypt. Go with me, please, to Exodus chapter 8. What protected Israel? Now remember, folks, we have a better covenant. That covenant includes divine protection Jesus made this statement he said now y'all do remember under the old covenant they were told no weapon formed against you shall prosper see our covenant includes everything that theirs had plus no weapon against us shall prosper right no plague shall come nigh thy dwelling the angel of the Lord shall have kept about thee to deliver thee Here in Exodus. Yeah, Jesus, he went on to tell them, he said, I give you authority over all the power of the enemy, Satan, and nothing by any means shall harm you. Let, let me stop right here. i got to help somebody. If some of you bogged down a little bit, i got to help you a little bit. How many of you know that just because God said something about you doesn't automatically mean it's going to happen? How many know that? Just because God said something about you, just because it's God's will for your life, just because God wants it for you, does not mean it's going to happen automatically and all by itself. Now, I'm going to show you something. How many of you know that God told the first generation that came out of Egypt, of the Israelites, that He wanted to take them to the promised land? God had picked out the most abundant fertile land, probably upon the face of the earth, no doubt it is, and told them, I'm going to give this to you. If you will obey me, I'm going to take you and lead you to this land. 
But if you read Hebrews 3 and 4, you find out that first generation did not go into the promised land. They never inherited it. They never walked on it and lived on it. Why? God said, I've given you the land. I want you to go in and possess the land. Don't be afraid of the giants. But what did they say? Over and over, we're going to die in this wilderness. We're going to die in this wilderness. Why don't we just turn around and go back to Egypt? Man, there were some good onions back there in Egypt, you know. I remember those onions. We're going to die out here. You know what happened to them? Did they go into the promised land? First generation never went in. God wanted them to go in, but they didn't go in. God wants you to go in to abundance. Listen to me. They didn't get what God said. They got what they said. Are y'all getting this? You're not going to get necessarily what God said. You're going to get what you say, what God said. If you say what God said, you're going to get what God said you're going to get. You got that? If you say what God said and you agree with Him, you're going to get what God said you're going to get. But if God said it and you said something different, you're not going to get what God said. You're going to, say you, you're going to get what you said you're going to get. Right. Amen? So watch your mouth. Tell your neighbor, say, watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Amen? Set a watch upon the door of my lips, David said. Woo! Because that door let things in and it'll get things out. Amen? That's what the purpose of a door is. To enter and to exit, right? Oh, yeah. You let things in your life through these lips. You get things out of your life through these lips. Can y'all imagine this? Jesus goes to Peter's house one day, and there's, there's his mother-in-law. She's laying sick of a fever. And instead of standing over here and saying, serves you right, mean old hag. No, I didn't what he said, did he? He stood over her, and he spoke to the fever. He rebuked the fever. He rebuked the fever, and the fever left. Now, now, now tell, me, tell me if I'm missing something here. But if he spoke to the fever, and the fever left, then that means that the fever heard. That means the fever heard what he said. Oh, I'm going to tell you something else. Your body hears what you say. Your money hears what you say. Oh, if you're one of those, well, we can't afford it, honey. Why don't we go out tonight? We can't afford it. Your money just heard what you said and took off. Are y'all getting this? Amen. He spoke to a fig tree, and the fig tree heard it. Amen. You say, how do you know the fig tree heard? Because he told it to die, and the next day it was dead. Amen. So I know he, that fig tree heard what he said. Amen. Let me tell y'all something. If y'all was come by our house sometimes, and my wife's out in the yard to sneak up on her, you probably thought she lost her mind because she's out there talking to her trees and her plants and her flowers. She's out there talking to them, and she's not out there cursing them. She's not over saying, die, plant, die. No, she's saying, live. When you walk in your house, I challenge you today, when you walk in the door of your home, as soon as you walk through the threshold of your home, you stop and look, and your home say, peace be unto this home. Be fruitful and multiply in every way in Jesus' name. When you walk in the doors of this church, say, peace unto this house of God. Be fruitful and multiply in Jesus' name. Amen? Does that help anybody? Now, you're not going to get what Brother Milton says, what Pastor Eddie says, Pastor Allie says. Amen? You're going to get what you say. And if you want what God says you, you, you should have, then you've got to say what He says about you. Amen. Amen. Somebody said, I don't believe that. Well, believe what you want to. <laughs> stay sick, stay broke, stay poor. If you want to, I mean, I can't help it. God's going to change it. Amen. Amen. All right, I've got to move on here. Y'all got y'all to see something here. Exodus chapter 8. Now, just for a second time, I'm going I'm to skip through most of this and just show you real quickly the heart of the matter I want to point out that God protected Israel in Exodus 8.22 now the plagues the judgments that came against Egypt because Pharaoh would not let God's people go and in 8.22 this is where God told him he's going to send the flies in the land man I hate a fly I don't know about y'all but I hate a fly I'll chase a fly all over the house with fly swat until I kill that rascal amen I call him Beelzebub the devil means Lord of the fly. Beelzebub means Lord of the flies. When I see a fly, I think about the devil, and I'm going to kill that thing. And I'm going to do about everything I can to get it out of my house. Amen? And my wife discovered the secret of what you can plant outside your door to keep them devils out. 
But I got some, what do you call that stuff? Mint. Plant mint. Right outside the door. I'm going to tell you what. I got something better than mint. The blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Woo! It'll keep them devils out. I'm telling you. Now watch this. God said concerning this, Exodus 8, 22, I will sever. Everybody say sever. Sever means to set apart or to separate. And that day the land of Goshen, the land of Goshen where the children of Israel lived in the center of Egypt. Imagine this great big nation. Imagine right in the center, in the middle of Egypt, uh, a, 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 land, a plot of land that had been designated for the Jewish people to live on. Now they've grown into a great nation, millions of people, okay? God said, when I send this plague of flies into the land of Egypt, I'm going to separate the land of Goshen where my people dwell that no swarms of flies shall be there. And they had no flies. Exodus 9. Verse 4, he said, The Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt. There shall nothing die of all that is in the children of Israel. The plague attacked the cattle of Egypt. Verse 6 said, The Lord did that thing on the morrow, and all the cattle of Egypt died, but of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. Everybody say not one. one. 9.26, when God sent the, the hail. Verse 26, Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, were was there no hail. Chapter 10 Verse 22. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven. There was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But the children of Israel had light in their dwelling. And finally, the last of all, in Genesis 12, I mean Exodus 12, verse, well, I don't want to read all this, but this is the last plague, the death of the firstborn. And he told them, I want you to take a lamb for each house. Verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male the first year. Verse 7, you shall take of the blood, strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house, wherein they shall eat it, and they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire, unleavened bread. That means you've got to get the sin out of your life. Unleavened, leaven is symbolic of sin. And a little leaven, leavens the whole lump. Listen to me carefully. Listen to me very carefully right here, okay? A little leaven, Paul wrote, leavens the whole lump. You ladies that bake know that it doesn't take a whole lot of yeast to make that cake rise, right? Leaven is symbolic of sin. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little sin, you get in the picture here? Leads to greater sin. God's been telling me, pray for the congregation. Pray that Christ will be formed in their life. I want my people to live holy. Some of my people have sin in their lives. Tell them to get the sin out of their life. If you don't get the sin out of your life, the sin, your sin is going to get rid of you. I said if you don't get the sin out of your life, your sin will get rid of you. Because sin will kill you. Sin will destroy you. It will destroy your family. And God told the children of Israel, I want you to tell them, kill this lamb. A lamb without spot, without blemish, and put it on the doorpost. Now watch this. Verse 12, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Go with me to Revelation 12, 11. We're going to close with this. God protected the children of Israel by the blood. You could have been within sight of the blood and still died. He said, for tell them, do not go out of that door. Don't go out outside the house. Put the blood on the doorpost, and when the, the angel comes over, the death angel comes over, he'll see the blood, he'll pass over you. And listen to me, the firstborn of all of the Egyptians, man and beast, died, but none of the children of Israel died. They had to do what God told them to do. They had to be obedient. God put a hedge about Job. God put a hedge about the children of Israel by the blood of the Lamb. But how much more, how much greater, listen to me, folks, those of us that are protected by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. John the Baptist, the first time he laid eyes on Jesus Christ, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God who came and gave His blood, one sacrifice for all people for all time, and that blood, listen to me saying, that blood will protect you 
from every attack of the enemy. But you've got to have faith in the blood. I said you've got to have faith in the blood of Jesus. That blood is a living blood. That blood speaks better things than the blood of Abel that cried out from the ground for vengeance. The blood of Jesus cries out for mercy and for forgiveness. Amen? That blood cries out for protection. And they overcame him, the devil. Say it out loud. Say, I overcome the devil. Tell your neighbor, say, you overcome the devil. How do we overcome? By the blood of the Lamb. Everybody say it with me. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. And I'm telling you, listen to me, saint. It doesn't mean no difference what, devil, what the devil will throw at you, what kind of test may come your way from the devil. You can turn that test into a testimony if you refu- refuse. Do not be moved. Amen. Go to Psalm 112. Put it up every face. I want anybody to see it. Don't be moved. Psalm 112, uh, verse. Let's try verse 6. We'll find it. Psalm 112, talking about the righteous man. Okay? Let, let's see. Surely he, sh- there it is. Surely. Everybody say surely. surely. Hallelujah. My, my, my. Thank God. Thank God for surely. <laughs> That's a little inside joke, y'all. Surely he shall not be, what? I'm about to blow y'all's mind. The Holy Ghost blew my mind last night. I'm telling you, I got so stirred up when I saw this. For the first time, I have never seen this before. Aren't you glad you keep learning and keep growing? When the Holy Ghost tells you to do something, do it. He told me, he said, I want you to look at this word where Paul said, None of these things move me. Matter of fact, you want to write it down. None of, everybody said, I said, none of these things move me. Things move now leave this up here. I want everybody to see this. It says, Surely he shall not be moved. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. Verse 7. Everybody watch now. He shall not be afraid of what? Evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. He's not moved he's not afraid because of bad news now real quickly put up there acts 20 24 acts 20 24 thank god for the holy ghost this just i, I was i just had to keep going back and forth make sure now am I, am I doing this am i looking this right am i studying am i in the right place paul said but none of these things move me none of these things move me None of these things move me. Nothing that happens to me. Nothing that comes my way. None of the afflictions. None of the tests that the devil throws at me. None of the persecutions, the beatings, the fastings, the going without at times. The lies that people tell on me. The persecution that I face. None of these things move me. Y'all ready for this? That word move, this is really going to bless some of you who know a little bit about and been listening for the last couple of years. When I talk to you about the Greek and stuff, you go look at that word move up in the in the Greek in your concordance, and you know where it takes you to? L O G O S. Somebody tell me what logos is. It's word. Building blocks. Things spoken. None of these things spoken against me move me. Nothing they say about me moves me. Nothing the doctor says about my heart moves me. Nothing the baker says about my money moves me. Nothing, nothing anybody says moves me. I'll tell you what, though, what will move me when I say what God says. I'm going to have what God says I have. Amen. I believe God. Somebody shout, I believe God. I believe God. Hallelujah. And if you'll believe God like Abraham, it will be accounted to you as righteousness. It will be put to your credit. Bless God. And you will live in victory. Somebody shout, shout to the Lord with me. Come on, get up and shout to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. None of these things move me. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise your holy name. Come on and move this out of the way real quickly for me. Blessed be the Lord. Isn't God good? Don't be moved by evil tidings. Don't be moved by bad news. Amen. Don't be moved by what people say. 
If it's not in line with that word, don't receive it, don't receive it, don't believe it. Amen. Act on the truth and turn every test into a testimony. If you would, bow your heads real quickly. If there's anybody here this morning, you're not born again, you want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, I want you to raise your hand real quickly. You say, today I want to be saved. Maybe you're here and you say, I've been saved, but I haven't been living for God. I want to come closer, uh, draw nearer to God. I need to rededicate my life to Him. I need to repent of sin in my life. If that's you, lift your hand real quickly because God sees your hand and God sees your heart. Anybody at all, you say, that's me, Pastor. For the sake of those that raised a hand or wish they'd raised a hand, for the sake of those that are watching through the live stream, I want you to pray out loud with me. And when you pray from your heart, believe that God hears you and believe that you receive the forgiveness of the Lord, the love of God, because He does love you. He wants to restore you. Say it out loud. Say, Lord God, I believe with all my heart that Jesus died for me, that He rose from the dead, and I have faith in His blood. This day, I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I receive you by faith. You are mine, and I am yours. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving me of all my sin. Thank you, Lord, that I'm a new creature in Christ. Right now, by the blood of Jesus, amen. So just, if you would just lift your hands for a moment and worship the Lord. Praise your holy name. Praise your holy name. We love you, Lord, and we bless you. We praise you. We give you all the honor and glory. Apart from you, Lord, we can do nothing. But you said at the same time that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Maybe you're here today and you're, you've been going through a test. Maybe you have had difficulties, hardships in your life. Maybe you're watching by the internet tonight through the live stream. Maybe some of you have heard this message and you say, I know that God has spoken to me and I'm ready to receive from Him right now. you got a purpose in your heart to put God first in your life. you got a purpose in your heart to trust God. you got a purpose in your heart to know that God is good and every good and perfect gift comes from Him. Without faith it's impossible to please God for he that comes to God must believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. Right now, if you need prayer, I want you to get up and come down. I believe the healing anointing will heal your body. I believe the anointing will deliver you from bondage of alcohol or drugs or anything else that you, you feel in bondage to. If that's you, I want you to get up and come down right now. Maybe there's some of you here, you say, Pastor, I have prayed and I believe I received. And I just want you to stand with me. And I want the people of God to stand with me. Raise your hand if that's you. Yeah, I see that hand. Yeah, I see that hand. All right, your hand's all over the place. I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to pray for those that are watching as well. And I want you to just, in some way, to release your faith as a point of contact. It might be if you're praying for your marriage, reach over and take your husband or wife by the hand if you can. If not, just uh, imagine them, see them in your, in your mind's eye. If it's concerning your finances, put your hand on your wallet, your purse, your checkbook or something. If it's concerning your body, lay your hands on your body. Some way, release your faith to make a point of contact. So when I pray, I want you to believe you receive. And then I want you to acknowledge, at least mentally, if not actually writing it down, today's date and this time when you believe you receive, so that every time you look at that, you can say, that's when I believe I receive my healing. That's when I believe I receive my deliverance. That's when I believe I receive from God that which I ask of Him. And I know that He hears us when we pray. And all you do from then on is just start praising Him. Start praising Him and thanking Him for it. Heavenly Father, right now, on behalf of those, Lord, that lifted their hands, on behalf of those, Father God, are believing to receive, they've already prayed, many of them have, they're standing, and they want us to stand with them. Father, I believe your word is truth. And we know, Father, that you watch over your word to perform it. I pray for these, Father, right now. I join my faith with them. I speak words of healing right now to their body. I speak words of blessing into their families, into their finances, into every situation in their lives. And Father God, we put the name of the Lord upon them right now. May your face shine upon them. 
May you watch over them and keep them and bless them. Lord, peace be into their houses, in their homes. In Jesus' name, may they be fruitful and multiply in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you for doing it, Lord. Amen. God bless you, saints. We love you so much. Brother Darrell wants to meet with the ushers as soon as the service is over right over here, if you would. We appreciate you so much. Don't forget now, the devotions uh, are at the back. The ushers have those. Get your devotions as you go out. Wednesday night, we'll be having service at 7 o'clock and again next Sunday at 10 a.m. God bless you. You're dismissed.